Political Zionism had some core components. Shortly after Theodor Herzl founded the movement at the end of the 19th century, yet at the center stood the secularists, who were the mainstream in building the idea of a Jewish homeland and a Jewish state. However, alongside them were a modern Orthodox stream, known as the National Religious, that admired the secularists for their commitment to the project. Nevertheless, they wanted more tradition, more focus on biblical sources, more focus on humanitarian principles. In fact, it was always a moderating force of Israeli politics. The government ministers, who were the last holdouts of the Israeli cabinet in June 1967, before agreeing to go to war with Egypt, were these national religious. They wanted to avert bloodshed, and they wanted to maintain close ties to Washington. Yet by the end of 2022, a subgroup among them took almost an apple pie name of the movement and used it for its own purposes. This religious Zionist party, known as RZP Alliance, took 14 seats in the 120-member Knesset, with its leaders poised to take ministerial positions in the incoming right religious government. Many mainstream religious Zionists were appalled that this party claimed to speak in their name and advance ideas that stood at such tension with the idea of Israel as a liberal democracy. Hello, and welcome to Decision Points. My name is Dave Murkowski, Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I'm excited to go on this passage through history with you. This podcast might be a chance to go back to look at the origins of this movement. How did it have a leader who was both a modern nationalist and a universalist, all while insisting both of these ideas of modernity were utterly consistent with Jewish law? And what has been the journey of this movement? How have perhaps a vocal minority run astray from the very ideas favored by its founding leader? Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook, sometimes called Rav Cook in Hebrew, is considered a founder of religious Zionism. He was born in 1865 in what today is called Latvia. He read widely. He was named the first chief rabbi of Jaffa in 1904, and he moved to the Holy Land. Rabbi Cook was a universalist who saw Zionism, even the secular socialist version, which was dominant at the time as justified because it would help return the Jewish people to the land of Israel. Where most Orthodox rabbis of this time rejected Zionism, saying it had to wait for the Messiah, he embraced the new movement. He was its leader, the first chief rabbi of the Jewish community of British Mandatory Palestine from 1921 to his death in 1935. Though Rabbi Cook did not live to see the Jewish state formed in 1948, and the state was certainly more secular than he would have liked, his ideology lived on. Yet by the time of the 1967 Six-Day War, in which Israel acquired the West Bank, it turned out to be a watershed movement for the religious Zionist community, leading many in that camp to believe there had been a rendezvous with destiny, and the messianic era had actually just begun. However, it was this shocking and bloody stalemate in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, which galvanized the movement and saw the young religious Zionists born in the land, replacing their elders who were more European, and also not just replacing the leadership of the religious Zionist movement, but also replacing the labor settlers, the pioneers of a previous generation. These religious Zionists always envied those, wanted to be the pioneers that these people were a generation ago. And they immediately set up settlements in the West Bank after it had been captured, led by a group called the Block of the Faithful, Gush Emunim. These religious nationalists would grow, fracture, and transform over the intervening half century into the extremely complex religious Zionist sector we see today making up an estimated rough quarter of the Israeli Jewish population. The religious Zionists of today serve in the Israeli army combat units as officers at high rates and are often at the forefront of business and tech, and some believe themselves to be the last remaining sector of Israeli society that is ready to profoundly sacrifice personal comfort on behalf of the wider community. However, 
the more radical components of the community are also some of the main drivers of tension with the Palestinians of the West Bank today, representing the far right edge of Israeli politics, what we would call the RZP. These elements believe territorial compromise when it comes to the West Bank is not just politically misguided, but is actually religiously illegitimate. They don't think biblical patrimony is something to be traded away, but rather it is a principle to be defended. The trajectory of the religious Zionist community in all its diversity and passion is therefore something of enormous interest to all of those who want to learn about Israel today. Here to discuss the thought of Rabbi Cook and his son, Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Cook, the nature and the evolution of the religious Zionist movement and its implications for Israel is Professor Yehuda Mirsky. Yehuda is a professor of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies at Brandeis University and sits on the faculty of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. He is a former colleague at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and worked as a special advisor in the U.S. State Department's Human Rights Bureau during the Clinton administration. Yehuda has written widely on many subjects, but he has written very deeply on Rav Cook and religious Zionism, and is the author of the excellent volume, Rav Cook, Mystic in a Time of Revolution. Yehuda's many years spent in Israel and his deep investment in both secular and religious education makes him an excellent guide to this intellectual current within Judaism and Zionism. Yehuda Mirsky, Hi. welcome. We are delighted to have you on this podcast, Decision Points. Oh, it's a real great, great, great pleasure. So many of our listeners are really engaged in the history of Israel. But Rabbi Cook is a figure who is little known in the English-speaking world. He was the same generation of Herzl, yet he remained active and relevant in the time of Ben-Gurion and Jabotinsky. Can you tell us a little bit about how his ideology differed from mainstream Zionism of his time? Sure. So first a word about Zionism at the time, right? Listeners know this, but it's worth repeating. So Zionism arose in the late 19th century as a response to two interrelated sets of crises. What the great Zionist writer, thinker, Achad Ha'am, referred to as the problem of the Jews and the problem of Judaism, right? The problem of the Jews, anti-Semitism, poverty, dislocation, all kinds of social and economic and political disability and harm being done to Jews. What do you do to help that? And the problem of Judaism, the collapse of Jewish culture, belief, community in modern times. The whole landscape of modern Jewish history is about different attempts to deal with these two interlocking crises, the crises of Jewish politics and survival, physical survival, and the crisis of Jewish meaning and cultural and religious survival. And Zionism was one of those movements, and it mixed and matched. So there were people for whom Zionism, like Theodore Herzl, was a pretty straightforward, I mean, visionary and different, but a project of taking care of anti-Semitism and the problem of the Jews. And there were others for whom Zionism was the problem of Judaism. How do you Can you, perhaps you can, revitalize, reinvigorate Jewish life through a new kind of Jewish culture, Hebrew culture, maybe not a religious culture and way of life? And that too came in different forms. And this was also mixing and matching with other ideologies of the time, like the socialist revolutionary ideologies that were so powerful and compelling to Jews suffering in the Russian Empire as it was going through its dying throes. Now, This was the landscape, the really rich and complicated and interesting and highly conflicted landscape of Zionist movement at the time. We're talking about the late 19th, early 20th century. Now, where are the religious Jews in all of this, and especially the rabbis? If we take a look at how most rabbis responded, traditional rabbis, today we'd call them orthodox, but we could say traditionalist rabbis, responded to the Zionist movement, most of them didn't like it. They didn't like it for a number of reasons. They didn't like it because, and here I'm talking about the rabbis, less the masses, but more the rabbis. They didn't like it because, well, who the heck is Theodore Herzl, this Jew who's hardly ever seen the inside of a synagogue, and he's going to be the new Messiah and leader of the Jews? Who needs a new secular Hebrew culture? 
Hebrew is a sacred language. You're supposed to use it for prayer, for theology, for study, not for buying groceries and certainly not for, you know, writing musicals and plays and things like that, right? Those traditionalists correctly understood the ways in which Zionism is a really revolutionary movement. What's more, Zionism seems to run counter to the logic that kept the Jews alive for centuries, which was keep your head low, don't make trouble, don't engage in activist politics, don't get involved in wars and empires and stuff because you're because that's a recipe for suicide. Right? You had some rabbis who actually approved of Zionism, traditionalist rabbis, who even joined the Zionist movement. It created sort of what was called the Mizrahi, something we'll be talking about before, which was the official religious party within the Zionist movement, because remember, the World Zionist Organization was comprised of parties that eventually became parties in, in the state of Israel. And they joined the Zionist movement because they thought that Zionism was not a bad way of dealing with Jewish social and economic and political disability. And it had a whiff of tradition about it. But like, please, please don't tell us that this is about revitalizing Jewish culture and that this is a new way of like living Jewish identity. Just like, just don't go there. That was their stance. And then you have Abraham Isaac Cook. He's born in 1865. He dies in 1935. He is the most important rabbinic figure to come out and endorse the Zionist movement on a very distinctive set of terms. He's less focused on Zionism as the answer to anti-Semitism. He sees the Zionist revolution in Jewish culture as itself a good thing, right? He sees, you know, he, like others, is trying to figure out how and why Jewish culture has so collapsed, Jewish religious life has so collapsed in the late 19th century. And also really crucial to him, and this is something about him that resonates today, how is it that so many of the best and brightest and most committed and idealistic young Jews find themselves rejecting religion and participating in these socialist and revolutionary movements and in the Zionist movement and its uprisings? Why did it collapse at this time? Was it about the Jews were urbanizing, leaving the shtetl known as, or the village to go to the big cities in Europe, going to universities for the first time? It's like this. Okay. We have this myth that Jews were utterly powerless and without government for thousands of years. That's not the case. Jews didn't have states. But a crucial feature of Jewish life up to modern times was Jews had a lot of authority over their own communities. And not only Jews, pre-modern societies, you know, think of the Ottoman Empire, where religious communities ruled themselves. Think about pre-modern Europe, where, you know, like the entities that today we know as Germany and France didn't really exist, right? There were these Germanic-speaking lands and these Frankish lands. And within them, you know, generally in the pre-modern world, different communities had different sets of laws and they were overlapping. There were some laws that applied to me as a Jew and others that applied to me as a craftsman and other laws that applied to me as like somebody who runs a, an inn sometime, right? Different groups have different laws. With the modern state, starting in like 17th, 18th century and all the more after the French Revolution, you have this notion of one state, one law, right? France is one thing. It's one government with one law and there's no room for other legal systems. So the Jews, starting in Western Europe, lose the control that they've had over their lives. The community loses the control that it's had over their lives. What makes Benedict Spinoza, the heretical philosopher, the first modern Jew? It's that when he gets excommunicated from the Jewish community of Amsterdam, he has some place to go. And he doesn't have to convert to Christianity. You have this thing called secular Jewishness. And this, in turn creates a problem of national identity. So if everybody is French, what are the Jews, right? If everybody in Germany is a German, then what are the Jews exactly, right? And we could talk a very long time about this. Under the czars in Eastern Europe, it proceeds a bit differently. Modernization, the Jewish community gets disestablished, but it also comes with a lot of oppression and all of that. But at the same time, you have the same challenges to traditional religion that come from modern science and modern philosophy that intellectuals are always dealing with. And you have Jewish society, especially in Eastern Europe. It's poor. It's subject to persecution. 
once immigration to America is possible, people go in mass numbers. So there's the bottom drops out of Jewish community. There's the pull of Western culture, right? There's the push outward because the larger political and social institutions that held that from the outside world that that created Jewish community are no longer there. There's the pull of the outside world. And the amazing thing is that this is a time of great crisis and also a time of like incredible Jewish cultural creativity in literature, in the arts, in religion, even in traditional religion. This is this is like the, fl- the flowering of Hasidism. This is like these remarkable things going on. So in all of this, there arises this figure, Abraham Isaac Cook. He is of a mixed Hasidic and non-Hasidic family background, which is to say that a part of his family is descended from these Hasidic mystics, and the other part of his family is descended from these like highly scholastic, intellectual-minded Lithuanian rabbis. He comes of age in late 19th century Europe, and he's keenly alive to all that's going on around him. And by the way, there's remarkable cultural and intellectual ferment going on in Eastern Europe. You read the Hebrew and Yiddish newspapers of the time, and people are arguing brilliantly and fascinatingly about all kinds of things. And he turns to Zionism, like many people do because it helps him understand certain philosophical and theological problems. Like, okay, I get that like Jews are highly spiritual and highly ethical, but they also have to find a way to live in the physical world. How am I going to do that? Jews have to have a distinct identity, but they have to have a way of doing it in a way that brings them into conversation with the rest of the world. You know, we're very focused, understandably, on Zionism as a political movement, but we forget the ways in which Zionism, and Rav Cook is a great example, Zionism enabled people to think creatively about their own dilemmas of identity. Who am I as a Jew, as a European, as a citizen of the Ottoman Empire? I care about universal ethics, and I also care about Jewish peoplehood. I care about culture, but I can't just replicate the culture that I was raised in. And he puts himself very much in the middle of that. In 1904, he moves to Palestine to become the chief rabbi of the city of Jaffa. Now, there is no such thing as Tel Aviv then, which is to say that Tel Aviv rises on the sand dunes near Jaffa. That's by way of saying Jaffa is, so to speak, the capital of the new Jewish community taking shape in Palestine. So if the rabbis of Jerusalem, Jerusalem is changing a lot in those years too, but if Jerusalem is still the citadel of, of the traditionalist rabbis, who met, most of whom are very opposed to Zionism, Jaffa is the capital, of, and he there tries to develop ideas of Jewish identity and education, and more than that, he comes to the conclusion, because again, this is the late 19th, early 20th century, and for when he's doing much of his important thinking, it's before World War I. He's very much an idealist of the 19th century and a believer in progress the way many people in the 19th century were. And he sees in modernity and at the turn of the century all these contradictions coming to the surface. Jews being nationalists and these Jews being universalists, Jews being like really secular and Jews doubling or tripling down on religion, right? He sees these explosions in art and art almost like being able to convey dimensions of human experience and of contact with transcendence that traditional religion is no longer able to provide. He sees all these things and he concludes that this is because we are on the edge of a messianic era. And this comes from his reading in philosophy. It comes from his reading in the Jewish mystical tradition and texts and note ideas in the Jewish mystical tradition that the messianic restoration isn't some sort of simple Jewish victory or a temple descending miraculously from heaven. It's the redemption of the entire human race. And it's the redemption of the entire human race when it comes, and this is his, uh, we don't have time to go into it now, but in a brilliant synthesis of Jewish mystical and modern philosophical ideas, that human idealism, human ideals for a better world, for justice, for peace, for beauty, for community, for solidarity, are God's way of speaking in the world. 
And it is the job of the Jewish and the seeming contradictions of the Jewish people that they're both nationalist and universalist, that it's a very spiritual religion, but a religion that's very concerned with like how you live your life in very concrete and physical ways, that the Jewish people experience the deepest contradictions of humanity. And so through this remarkable return to Zion, they will show the rest of humanity. the way. It's remarkable. It's beautiful. It's brilliant. It's naive. It's an incredibly deep reading of what's going on in his times. And it's like a, an astonishing misreading of the motives of the people around him. But what emerges is he's, first off, he's a, a really important rabbinic figure in his own right. He's not just some ideologue or propagandist. He's a major scholar, right? He's a scion of the rabbinic aristocracy. His, he has this stunning command of the entirety of Jewish Bible, Talmud, philosophy, mysticism, poetry, and law. He's a really important legal decisor. He develops creative Jewish legal doctrines that can like meet the conditions of modernity. He has these ideas for educating rabbis who will be able to like be in dialogue with modern society. At the same time, he's deeply committed to the tradition at the same time. There's his personal charisma. He's a fascinating figure. And he, more than anyone, develops a full-blown theology to provide a bedrock for religious Jewish commitment to this project of Jewish nationalism in the new land of Israel. And it's a very heady and very combustible mix of ideas. So you say that he was trying to answer a kind of Jewish religious cultural question. How do you deal with the collapse of people's religious commitment? And then you also said that nationalism flows from broader forces of how he sees the march of humanity, if you will. So he's trying to answer something that's both very particular, some would say mystical, and also both universalist at the same time. How do you take that vision and turn it into a political ideology? Ah, that's the very difficult part. Like, in my book, I found, for instance, he fought, he's stranded in, in, in Europe at the outbreak of World War I. He goes there for a rabbinic conference. The war breaks out. He's stuck there for a while. He's in Switzerland. Then he's in London. He's in London during World War I. So Chaim Weizmann is busy cooking up the Balfour Declaration. So Chaim Weizmann sends his right-hand man, Nachum Sokolow, to say, look, the great Rabbi Cook of Yafo is sitting in London. Let's enlist him in the work of lobbying for the Balfour Declaration. Sokolow goes and talks to him. And he comes back and he writes to Weizmann. He says, look, he's a very great man. He's a very great thinker, but there's really nothing to talk to him about. Like, how do I lobby this member of parliament to move that thing along? It's just not, you know, it seems another person said, said they basically spent their time talking about whether or not Spinoza's ideas were rooted in the Jewish mystical tradition or not. Like, that's what they were talking about. But what happens is Rav Cook has these very arresting insights that he doesn't quite know, and almost almost too large to be translated into, right into into concrete programs. The Balfour Declaration electrifies him because during World War One, like everyone else, he's totally appalled by the slaughter, the rivers of blood, the you know the sheer human misery and suffering of it. And at times, like many Jews over the years, when you see a horrible cataclysmic war going on, you think maybe this is the footsteps of the Messiah approaching. And then, boom, the Balfour Declaration. Right. Not for the first time that that external events seem to confirm his messianic reading of events. So he thinks, OK, I got to do something. Now, he has a very powerful insight that the Zionist movement as a purely secular movement won't be able to sustain itself. There's no reason why Zionism, that Zionism without a profound relation to Jewish tradition, history, morals, ethics, won't, won't be able to sustain itself as anything other than an extremely parochial and likely violent nationalism, right? So it needs something else, right? And he, he lays out a blueprint for like a parallel organization to the World Zionist Organization that will have its own schools and it'll have its own periodicals and, it's, and it'll all be about plumbing the depths of the meaning of the Jewish cultural and spiritual renaissance, right? Right. 
Now, it's great, except nobody around him is invested in this. None of the political parties around him are interested in this. He's like extremely inspiring, but not a great organizer, right? And something that starts cropping up then and here, he's not alone among early among any number of early Zionists. On the one hand, he's alive to the moral perils of nationalism. But he thinks that Jewish nationalism will be different. Because Jews are different, because Jews have the historical experience of suffering, because there's no way that God would direct his people back to Zion in a way that would innate that would force them to engage in violence. But he does do some institution building when he's back in Palestine after World War I. First, he becomes the chief rabbi of Jerusalem. And then in 1921, he becomes the first Ashkenazi, European origin chief rabbi. In a way, he has to do institution building because like, part of the power of his thinking is that there is no theology without practice and there's no practice without theology, right? That you can't do without thinking and you can't think without doing. So inevitably, he was going to try to do things. So really important, of course, is the creation of the chief rabbinate in 1921. And who creates it? There's Okay, there's actually several partners to the creation of the chief rabbinate. The British. First off, there's a system that everybody inherited. I mentioned earlier the Ottoman Empire. We tend to forget just how large, important the Ottoman Empire was for so long. Under the Ottomans, different religious communities, Jews, Christians, Muslims, had their own systems, their own religious authorities and institutions and law courts and so on, with, of course, under the Ottomans, the Muslims clearly on top. This way of organizing things wasn't just something that the Ottomans, I mean, this under the Ottomans and under you know other Islamic civilizations, this had gone on for a very long time, but also European countries, like from Napoleon on, one of the ways in which you managed your colonies was you sort of, you find the local notables, you put them in charge of the things that don't really matter to you, like, you know, religion, marriage, divorce, inheritance laws, whatever. Have them, where you don't have to worry about that. Let them take care of it, right? So the British knew that the Ottomans had this system. They kind of liked it. The Zionists, like after World War I, after Balfour, the Zionists are really into institution building. They're building trade unions and they're building cities and they're building all kinds of things. And they, they're building the Hebrew University. And they also want to build religious institutions that can sort of organize things, that can represent Jewish religious public opinion to the world, and crucially, that they can control through their budgets. And again, to Americans, this is all very odd. What is it? But like for most European countries, including Western European democracies, it's like extremely common to have state-sponsored religion. And, you know, that's just how, how things were done. And then you, there's only one person who can really fit the bill to be like the Ashkenazi chief rabbi, and that's Rev Cook, because of his stature and because he's the one person who, you know, the Zionists can talk to him. The religious people can talk to him, that kind of thing. And he has a full-blown theology and program for this. Potentially, he's everyone's interlocutor. Well, he's almost everyone's interlocutor. We'll get to the almost in a second. You know, the thing is that his vision of what he's doing is very different from that of the other people. He thinks that he's creating a new set of institutions which finally will take the bull by the horns, be able to make the necessary changes in Jewish law, create a new transformed Judaism that's like spiritualized law and law-driven spirituality and all that. And he's like in a very different place from all these folks. The people who aren't talking to him are the true ultra-Orthodox, right? Today, what we call the Haredim. For them, the, the people who are the ancestors of today's, you know, Yahadura Torah party. Haredim, or you say in English, I guess the word would be trembler, like Quakers, you know, they use the same phrase. Yeah, but they're rather unquaker like in their behavior. You know, the ultra Orthodox who, in a, you see, because part of Rev Cook's thing, and here he's up a piece of all sorts of thinkers, Jewish thinkers in America, he's a, and what we would call an Orthodox rabbi who wants to be in dialogue with secular culture because he thinks it's really valuable. He thinks there's, he, that Jewish life is in dialogue with the best, the, you know, like Matthew Arnold said, the best has been thought and said is in culture, right? That Jewish life has a lot to be a lot of opportunities for dialogue and enrichment with things like the arts and history, but and philosophy and culture in general and and sort of the, the, the positive sides of modern life and technology and aesthetics and stuff like that. And the ultra-Orthodox, for reasons that are very understandable, don't want any of that. It's profoundly destabilizing and changing. And they 
opt out of this whole new structure that's being created of a Jewish community with religious authority given to the rabbinate. And by the way, the British are happy to accommodate them, right? Because the ultra-Orthodox, unlike the Zionists, are a pain in the neck, right? The British start regretting the Balfour Declaration almost the day after they issue it. The ultra-Orthodox are great because, and, and the British say this, they have no political ambitions. They just want to be left alone, you know, and Rev Cook becomes the ultra-Orthodox almost like they come to see him as their worst enemy because he looks like them, he lives like them, he thinks like them in many ways, and yet he's sanctifying this thing. So let me just ask you, bringing you to the end of his life, he lives till 1935. By 1935, David Ben-Gurion was already saying the ground is burning, the Jews of Europe are doomed, but Rabbi Cook has this very optimistic view of the world. You know, I mean, Ben Gurion doesn't know how many millions are going to be killed, but he's he sees things in pretty apocalyptic terms. Does Rabbi Cook share that? It's like this. If we look at the conflict with the Arabs, say, again, like many early Zionists, he's kind of willfully blind to this. Also bearing in mind that Palestinian nationalism, as we know, it is only starting to come into existence a couple of years before World War I, right? In saying that, I don't mean to like denigrate or dismiss of course. the significance of Palestinian nationalism, certainly not as a fact of, of our lives today. But like the first newspaper with the word Philistine in the title, like Arab is like in 1911. So he's among his disciples, you know, he's always telling his disciples, we're not at war with the Arabs. We're not going to do this violently. This is not how this thing is going to work. Crucially, after the riots of 1929, right, so like the massive Arab disturbances of 1929. He and, and the sort of the massacres and the killings and the violence, and he throws himself in trying to provide relief for the victims and trying to convince the British to act. Interestingly, afterwards, the Mufti of Jerusalem keeps writing these open letters to Rabbi Cook as trying to draw him into some sort of rhetorical combat. Like the Mufti very much wants to set this up as like an interreligious war. And, and Rabbi Cook steadfastly refuses to be drawn into that. In the early 1930s and with the rise of Hitler, most of his efforts go into trying to quell internal Jewish controversies, right? You know, because so much of Rav Cook's whole attitude was that I have something to learn from the people who disagree with me. We have to learn to not just to live with, but to learn how to learn from the people who disagree with us. And that lands him in the middle of the huge fights, some of which resonate in Israel today, between the labor Zionists and Jabotinsky's revisionists. Now, he himself never belonged to either camp. He himself never joined a political party. But because in the very celebrated Arlozarov affair, when he came to the, to the defense of Jabotinskyite activists who were accused of killing the foreign minister, so to speak, of Mapai, of the, of the workers' movement, Chaim Arlozarov, so Ben Gurion Ben Gurion uh, came to see Rav Cook as this like crazy right wing Jabotinsky, which of course he wasn't. His very ecumenical, broadly tolerant vision had a very rough time in the highly conflictual politics of the 1930s, especially as Hitler is cranking up. Now, in the last Rosh Hashanah of his life, he gives a sermon where he talks about the different kind of. He says on Rosh Hashanah you have to blow the shofar, the ram's horn. And within Jewish law, there's like tip-top quality, and then there's the medium quality, and there's like the one that barely gets by. And he says, you know, we always associate the blowing of the shofar with the ram's horn of redemption. So there's different kinds of redemption. The best kind is the kind that, yes, you're returning to Zion in order to revitalize Jewish life and culture and religion. You know, the medium kind is you want to go there because you want to have a healthy national existence. The worst kind is because you're running away from the anti-Semites, but that's redemption too. That's the closest he gets to this. And he dies in 1935. So now his son, Svi Yehuda Cook, he really takes on the mantle of his father's legacy. He tries, but he takes it in a very different direction. Right. Rav Cook does start a yeshiva. And again, he had these ideas of educating rabbis in a different way. And his son, Svi Yehuda Cook, becomes the head of the yeshiva eventually. Right. So he's the head of this rabbinical seminary, which we call... Merkaz Harav, the center of the rabbi. Until then, the yeshivot per se, the rabbinical seminaries are mostly dominated by the ultra-Orthodox. So this is different. Yes. But Svi Yehuda is carving out something different that enables him 
to work with a religious Zionist outlet. Yes. Importantly, thanks to Rav Cook, there's this whole generation of young rabbinic educators who have this vision of how to be a rabbi who's in dialogue with the society around you, who has an appreciation for art and culture and philosophy, and who has absorbed the revolutionary and pioneering spirit of Zionism. So you have, by the time Tzvi Yehuda is in his 70s, which is to say in the 1960s, you now have these cadres of young religious Zionists who, as they interpret Rav Cook's vision, see themselves as the Jewish version of the pioneering avant-garde who created the state of Israel. Right, because the avant-garde of Zionism in the 30s was really secular, and now it's a new generation, and they're getting a second chance to do what the secular did in the 1930s, become pioneers. And they have an interesting advantage because the 1967 war has just come out, and there's a sense of a rendezvous with destiny. Now there's a Jewish biblical patrimony in the West Bank that didn't exist. That land was not under Israel until 1967. And the settler movement begins then, and it begins in 1973. Right. And not only that, Sviuda has to deal with the Holocaust, and his father never did. And he comes to the conclusion, shocking as it may sound, that the Holocaust was what God did to get the Jewish people to the land of Israel which means that the land of Israel is even more important than we can imagine. And again, because in certain Jewish mystical conceptions, the land of Israel and the Jewish people and the Torah as a living document are all kind of the same because they're all how God manifests on earth. It sounds a little heady and abstract, but it can have very concrete. And so Tzviuda says, yes, this state with its post office, right, and its licensing bureau and its, you know, all the prosaic mundane details of this, this state created in 1948, is indeed the messianic redemption. This is the first step, this is it, which then means that planting the flag of Israeli sovereignty on a hilltop in the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria is a redemptive act, and as far as Sfiud is concerned, inheriting some of his father's ideas, not just for the Jewish people, but for the human race. It's like a, a new version of these like 19th century ideologies. But crucially, so as you say, like Tzvi Yehuda then becomes like the spiritual godfather of the settlement movement. But the settlement movement doesn't really take off until after the 1973 war. As heady and amazing as the Six-Day War is, as Gershom Gorenberg, our friend, shows in his amazing book, The Accidental Empire, before 73, most of the settlements by and large are done by labor Zionists out of their instinct that settling land is what you do. After the, the national crisis, the profound sense of crisis of the 1973 war convinces these young religious Zionists who were also serving in the army that now it's their turn. Because a lot of the backdrop here is that the secular gods, that is, the generals, had failed, so to speak, as the generals brought you the electrifying victory of 67. And in 1973, they are taken by surprise. Of course, it's not as much them as it is the political leadership, but here they are trying to fill a vacuum of leadership, right? Right, and, and not only and not only of military leadership, but there's this sense that Zionism is becoming bourgeois, it's becoming middle class, it's lost its pioneering spirit, and we're the ones who really understand what this thing is about, right? And that energy gets channeled into the settlement movement, which then becomes this project that's deeply invested in the settlement movement today. Now, what happens, what happens over time, right? What happens to all this messianic fervor? Because like life gets complicated, right? Over time, you know, you have the Intifada, you have the Palestinian uprising, you have the Madrid process, you have the Oslo process. We're talking about now about the 1980s, the 1990s. Or as these things are playing out and suddenly the redemptive process doesn't look one directional in terms of territory, because people are now giving up land under Oslo, which begins in 93. And here's a movement that's saying, hey, this giving up of land is not just politically misguided, but it's religiously illegitimate. And that's something different. And they are like the vanguard, the tip of the spear to resist this move of yielding land. And what I want to understand from you is that this seems maybe not a schism, but like splinters of some sort, that they themselves have been part of their movement are becoming much more middle class. Some would say upper middle class. In other words, the religious Zionists are not all one shoe fits all. 
Many of them are professionals. Yes, they want to keep a light religious head covering, but for the most part, they're like everybody else. They interpret religious Zionism more like it is in America, closer to being modern Orthodox. And it's a lifestyle as well as a set of beliefs. But there's another group that says this modern Orthodox group, they're becoming too comfortable, just too modern, because the allure of modern life is just too powerful. Right. And it goes even deeper than that, right? Sort of part of Rokuk's vision is that I'm willing to embrace this project of Jewish nationalism, you know, and eventually it's state building. And I also want to engage with the best of general secular culture and learning. I have what to learn from it. And you increasingly have people in, in the religious Zionist camp, and the prime exemplar of that is Bitsala Smutrich, who very much come out of it, raised in a school of thought that says that those are severable, that we have a religious commitment to, to Jewish nationalism and state building as we understand it. And we totally reject Western secular culture and its values, its ideals, its liberalism, its personal freedoms, all that kind of stuff, right? That's a really big cleavage here. And also they adopt an extremely combative, something, one of the amazing things with Rav Cook, and this is where he's like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or something like that, is that he's subject to relentless personal attacks in his lifetime from the left and from the right, and he never responds in kind, and he just develops this like remarkable capacity to like bear the slings and arrows of critics and to try to see what's the good in them. It's, it's mind-blowing. Somebody like Smutrich has none of that. People like me, <laughs> for the, as we're talking about it, are the enemy. We're worse than the enemy because I'm like, I'm like a very traditional Shabbat-keeping Jewish liberal. Right. So this is what I want our listeners to understand. This is the pivotal point. On one hand, you have this rabbi who's able to meld together the sense of nationalism for reasons we've discussed and which is also a strong universalistic component. He has both nationalism and universalism. Yet his heirs, Svi Yehuda and others, they're very skeptical of this legacy. And they take it in a very different direction that has become very nationalistic. Listeners might find confusing is that this new party in Israel, they've hijacked the name called religious Zionism, even though the large majority of people who call themselves religious Zionists, they might even be a third of Israeli Jews today, they don't hold to their political beliefs, but they're being tarred with the brush of this extreme political movement. So could you explain how these two camps coexist? Yes. Yeah, so there's this massive appropriation of this name, religious Zionism. It's like assuming that anybody in America, anybody who doesn't call themselves a Republican, doesn't believe in a Republican government, anyone who doesn't call themselves a Democrat, doesn't believe in Democratic government. Of course, that's not the case. And also these hard and fast categories of religious and secular that were like in the ideological wars of the 19th or the 20th century don't really exist anymore. You know, people do not see themselves as bound by religious authority, but they think that Jewish life and tradition has a place in Israeli public life, has a place in their own identities. But also, crucially, people like Smutrich are responding to, like, real cultural crises in Israeli society itself. That Israeli society, I mean, what's two major crises, two, two things that, like, embittered and angered generations of these young religious Zionists were the Oslo process and the Gaza disengagement. And part of it, there was a lot of reasons why. And but but when you talk to them and a lot of it was like that, you know, sometimes they'll say to me, like the establishment was allowed to disagree with us, but they didn't even credit our own idealistic motives. Like I, I didn't move to Gaza for easy housing. I moved to Gaza as part of a pioneering ethos and Sharon never paid attention to that. Yitzhak Rabin never paid a visit to a settlement during the whole Oslo process. And they said because also, and even when he spoke to them, like he was already speaking a different language and, and, and Israeli. And this is where Rav Cook had a point that Zionism entirely divorced from some deep, and some of the labor Zionist figures like Ben Gurion's colleague, Beryl Katz Nelson understood this, that if Zionism was had no way of dialoguing with Jewish tradition and culture in a meaningful way, it would run out of steam and it would also bring out the worst in religious Judaism. So just to summarize here, okay, we got a minority here that has hijacked the name of an ideology that basically maybe a third of Israeli Jews subscribe to. And as you point out, you have a lot of Sephardic Jews, what we call Mizrahi Jews, Jews from the Middle East. And they have different categories. They're traditionalist Zionists, but they're a minority. Let's take these two names, Betzalel Smotrich. 
you mentioned another name that we haven't mentioned yet, Itamar ben who sees himself as something different, a guy who is a, a follower of a militant named Mayor Kahana. Not mayor as in head of a city, but mayor. But when he comes to Israel, he's identified with this horrible idea of ethnic cleansing. Now, Itamar ben has tried to disassociate himself from that part, but he's very been affiliated with that movement for decades. And now he goes into politics. He goes, yeah, well, that was a bit extreme. So I'm trying to understand how did these two people take Rabbi Cook's legacy and uh, this minority stream of it, and where do they want to take this movement that they have tried to hijack? Yeah, three comments. One, Rabbi Cook is this canonical figure. He's, he's like up there in the Jewish pantheon with Maimonides and stuff like that in terms of like greatness as a theologian. But how we interpret him in the present day is still our own moral responsibility. Right. And I think that's something that's a point that gets lost in terms of how this happens, how they have such strength and suasion. There's a two part answer and part of it is sociological and the other is like ideological, sociological in the nature of things, religious communities like the settlement project or the religious world provides a kind of ongoing structure of ideologically committed community that the rest of Israeli society doesn't provide. Once upon a time, you had the kibbutz movement, and the kibbutz movement kind of no longer exists, right? You had the, sort of the, I mean, and this is a problem for American liberalism as well. This goes back to Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone book from a few years ago. There's a kind of civic webbing that you need in order to maintain an ideologically or, or a purpose-driven or a meaning-driven community, and the Israeli right wing does it in ways that the Israeli left just doesn't. And then the ideological thing is that it's very hard. I mean, you and I have been watching the ups and downs and vicissitudes and the longings of the Israeli, the broad Israeli center for decades, right? And it's hard for them to say what exactly they're for. Like figures as appealing in their own way as Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid are, it's unclear to the public, like what their message is, what their ideology is, what their vision of Israel is, what their vision of Israel's place in Jewish culture and world culture is. Now, the other team, they have a very clear vision. It's extremely, it's one that I don't like. It's one that I find extremely unappealing. But the, the ideological field has kind of been abandoned by the Israeli center in many, many ways. There's, that's part of it's, 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 a, it's a question of ideas. It's a question of being able to re-engage with Israeli culture. And I think that's part of the answer as well. And how does the silent majority of religious Zionists, who I don't identify with this more extreme version, how do they take back this movement more into the direction of Rabbi Cook? Is there a figure to rally around? How do they take it back from this militant minority? I'll tell you, it's hard because when I talk to people who voted, say, for Ben Gvir Smutrich, a lot of them don't agree with them, right? But it was a kind of sectoral tribal vote. It was people, as I think I've told you, like there's a guy I know who's a philanthropist who supports like really important Israeli Arab initiatives, and he voted for Ben Gvir Smutrich because of the crime, because of the corruption elsewhere, because and also because people who are like more hawkish on security don't trust Netanyahu worth a damn you know, because his track record for breaking promises to people is as remarkable as his track record on other things. So I think that there's, I, if you, if you read the, the, the things, if you talk to the young people, it is so often is the case, if you can get into conversations where people aren't screaming at one another, there's room to discuss things. But I think, and there are different institutions, if you know, we could talk about, you know, the centrist institutions or the more moderate yeshivot and, and that sort of thing. But it's still a long cultural and, and it's a sort of a cultural political struggle ahead, the same way Cold War liberalism, like managed to create a fighting faith that was like anti-communist and socially progressive. And it took a lot of work. So too, the new kind of religious Zionism. And crucially, it's going to need communities. It needs communities. It needs youth movements. It needs publications. It needs all that stuff, right? And what would Rabbi Cook say if he was alive today? You know, of course, that's the $64,000 question. You know, I don't presume to know. I would say two things. One, I think great, truly great thinkers, you can't really translate their ideas into like a concrete political programs. 
I do think he would be appalled at the rhetorical violence and the hatred directed by many of his self-styled, many of his latter-day disciples at people who disagree with them. That, I think, I think I'm on fairly <laughs> decent ground to say, even though these childs, like, he didn't have to deal with LGBT issues. He didn't, you know, he didn't have to deal with the kind of Palestinian politics that we have today. But from everything we know about him as a human being and his larger religious vision, the idea of essentially declaring war on everybody who disagrees with you, and also the places to which the leading religious figure behind the Smutrich wing of the party, Tzvi Tau, takes things, that the state of Israel is so holy that any Israeli soldier wearing a uniform is by definition ethical, assuming he's fighting for the Jewish people, one has to think that Reb Cook would never have gone that far, right? To utterly sanctify the secular, the instruments of power of the state. But again, whatever he would have thought, that doesn't get me and everyone else off the hook for making our moral choices today. So Yehuda Mursky, I want to thank you very much for really making Rabbi Abram Isaac Cook really accessible to us because people are grappling with developments today and want to wonder, how do we get from A to B? How could a small group really subvert the legacy of a really historic figure? So we will see how this unfolds. But we're so grateful to you for making this figure really comprehensible because in the English-speaking audience, he's really not known. And you've illuminated this figure for us today. I want to thank you very much well, thank for you. joining Decision Points. Thank you all. I just had a fascinating interview with Professor Yehuda Mursky, who wrote about a Zionist figure who's not well known outside of Israel, Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook. He was the first chief rabbi of the Jewish community in Palestine, and in many ways was a founding spiritual father of religious Zionism. Sadly, we are now in a time where there are politicians in Israel who have taken a mainstream idea and have hijacked its name for their own political purposes. However, religious Zionism as an idea and not as a party has wider resonance. Most of its followers, a good number of Israeli Jews, are believers in moderation and are followers of what I call the spirit of Rabbi Cook. His spirit was to combine universalist and humanitarian principles alongside a commitment to find a Jewish home with the flavor of tradition. All this was coming at a time of the persecution of Jews and of a disenchantment with religion at the start of the 20th century as Jews fled the shtetl or the village and looked for opportunities in major cities across Central and Eastern Europe. We're talking about the pre-Holocaust era. As we heard from Yehuda, Rabbi Cook was someone who felt the need to be relevant by being in dialogue with the people around him. This may have meant Zionist secular culture, or it meant religious movements. He avoided partisanship like the plague. Rabbi Cook saw Jews as highly spiritual and ethical, but this required them to always maintain that high standard and to be in conversation not just with themselves, but with the rest of the world. Nobody has the privilege of insularity. With all the myriad of challenges today, I think it's fair to say that it is this spirit of Rabbi Cook that needs to be revived. Thanks for listening to another episode of Decision Points. I want to thank all of our listeners from all over the world. I hope you listened to all of season four and to all previous seasons. You can find Decision Points on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts as well as on the Washington Institute website. Download and subscribe to never miss an episode. While you're there, please leave us a review and rating and tell your friends. I want to thank all those who made this podcast possible. Our coordinators, Gabriel Epstein, David Patkin, and Jonah Schrock, and our researchers, Valeria De La Fuente and Stuart Harris. I also want to thank Jeff Rubin, Scott Rogers, Carolina Krauskopf, and Maria Rodacci of the Washington Institute. And finally, 
Adrian Bain, our producer, and Richard Myron from Earshot Strategies. Thank you all.